and welcome back to the newest episode of the Film Stock Radio Show. Uh, my name is Kat and today I'm going to be hosting your most recent episode on documentary films and I'm joined with my excellent guests here. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves with a movie that you've seen recently in quarantine that you might like to recommend or if you haven't seen any in quarantine, just anything you'd like to recommend really. Um, hi, um, I'm Paul. I'm third year doing film and media so I do a bit of documentary. Um, a film that I would definitely recommend that I've seen is Drive by um, Nicholas Raffin. I think, yeah, um, it's, quite, it's quite a good soundtrack. That's why I really recommend people to watch it. Um, yeah. Um, I'm Hattie. I'm going into second year English literature and I watched the Michelle Obama documentary called Becoming. And it's really good. And the soundtrack's amazing. And it's just all, I love it. <laughs> Uh, I'm Patrick and I'm graduating, so I'm, I'm off. Um, I've, I've not really been watching much through lockdown, but one I did catch up on was Marriage Story, so I'd highly recommend that. That's a great yeah. set of recommendations. I've, I Somehow I've actually seen all three of those, like that never <laughs> happens. I'm really glad that you liked Marriage Story, uh, Patrick, because it's like one of my favourite movies of Yeah, it was so good, because I've been meaning to watch it for ages, and then obviously have found myself with a little bit of time to be able to uh, catch up on some stuff I've missed. I always, one of the funniest things for me, like the Noam Baltenbach, like directs it. If that's how I'm saying, is that the correct pronunciation? I think it is, isn't it? Noam Baumbach. I, th I think so. Um, no Baumbach, probably. Noam Baumbach. Yeah. But he, I was just talking to Jerry about it, but he, he also wrote Madagascar 3. I just think that's just the, the weird. Like, it's, it's, it's a weird combination. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a funny thing when you compare those two. They all, people like that have always got like, such a very odd, I don't know, set of things. But I really like Drive and um, The Becoming as well. I watched Becoming just, I finished it this morning and I thought like, it's just really endearing, isn't it? It's just very like, it gives you a lot of like energy somehow just seeing mm -hmm. her talk and seeing her like, she's just so elegant and so easy to kind of like watch and everything, isn't she Hattie? I just finished it and I was like, yeah, I can go do anything now. I'm like, I've, I've got all that. I can do whatever I want. I don't need anyone to stand in my way. I was like, I've got Michelle Obama power. I just, yeah. oh, she's amazing. <laughs> she's so good. <laughs> Drive we saw like a couple of months ago, I think, in Film Sock, didn't we? Like, I think it was one of the first things we streamed, I think, wasn't it? On a Netflix party. It might have been, yeah. Maybe. I can't remember. Or was it Rush that we streamed? Maybe it was Rush. Not we, Rush. We, defi it was Rush. we definitely streamed Rush. Rush. Um, Maybe I'm getting mixed up. Um, I'll just get straight into some like movie news and sort of um, Netflix top movies at the moment. So the most like top 10 movies on Netflix are number 10 is, this is a common theme, number 10 is Minions. Number nine is The Addams Family, the animation that just came out. Um, number eight is Feel the Beat. Number seven is Magnetic. Number six is The Five Bloods. Uh, number five is Lost Bullet or The Lost Bullet, yeah. Um, number four is Hereditary. Number three is Skyscraper. Number two is 365 Days. And number one is Hotel Transylvania 3. Uh, does any of these come as a surprise or any sort of like, a, how many of you, these have you seen recommending, you know? I actually don't think I've seen any of them. Really? Gosh. Yeah. I've seen Minions, that's it. <laughs> You've seen Minions? I've seen Minions. What did you think? I haven't seen it. The little I remember, it was um, slightly hellish, but okay. <laughs> like, I wouldn't go back and watch it again of my own free will. <laughs> that's fair. I think that's a fair assessment. Carl, what do you think of those set? Of um, I've seen about three of them. I'm definitely recommending Hereditary, um, which I'm sure Hattie has not seen yet. Um, you know this, <laughs> because George, who's, I know he's not watching, but he's been on at me for months to watch it, and then it came out on Netflix, and he's trying to convince me to Netflix buy it, and we still haven't, because I just, I'm a scaredy cat. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that Devon has been telling me and Stephen to watch Hereditary for months, if not like years um i mean we both just point blank refuse <laughs> there's no <laughs> chance is it, the, I think he, is it the fact that it's scary or is it just that like i don't know what is it about it that you're not like you're just like no i think i mean i really don't know all i know is that devon described a scene to us and i can't even remember the description 
It's but I know it was it was scary enough for me for me and Steven to be like, yeah, no, no chance. <laughs> I have no chance watching that. I thought it was really scary. Um, I also think like the, the there's been a continued pattern throughout the last like few times we've done the show where every like there's always like five animated movies that are like kids oriented, and then there's like four that no one's ever heard of. Like, I've never heard of Feel the Beat or Magnetic or Lost Bullet or I think I've heard of Skyscraper, but not 365 Days. And of course, The Five Bloods is the new Spike Lee movie. So I guess like that's kind of popular because it's auteur and everything. But like, I haven't personally seen it. Have any of you guys seen it? No, it's on the watch. Oh. It's on the watch list, but no, I haven't seen it. But so yeah, common theme throughout uh, <laughs> Netflix every week. Uh, so now movie news. Uh, I'm actually going to hand over to our guest Hattie to tell us a little bit about this, but um, the Oscars uh, 2021 ceremony has been officially delayed until April. Hattie, would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Um, so in Oscars fashion, they didn't go with the flow and put it online. They said, no, oh. we'll just push it back two months. <laughs> um, so it's the first time that it's been delayed in like 30 years, I think, 40 years. Um, and now it's on April 25th, um, so that'll be whatever it'll be, it'll, who knows. Um, the awards eligibility, so the period that films can be like nominated in, is now the date that the ceremony was going to be on, so February 28th. So there's a few more films that could become eligible, Peter Rabbit 2 um, <laughs> is, the, is the leader, um, but you know. It's just, I just find it all bizarre and I feel like they might end up pushing it back again because I just don't know if it'll be safe enough to do it the way they want to do it and mm. have everyone there. Because the thing is, you can't tell Steven Spielberg that he can't go to the Oscars. It's a little bit difficult. Think, like with, with that, there's absolutely no chance that they'll do it online. They'll be, there's so much money in the actual event itself that there's they they won't they wouldn't want to risk losing that much money by having it online. So they will just keep pushing it back, I think. I mean even the like the gift bags that they do and they do like a reveal every year and it's like millions of dollars it must be in worth and like here's a cruise because you've been nominated for an Oscar and things like it's just insane. It's literally bonkers the companies are getting involved with it. But um They'll keep waiting, I think, until it's safe enough. But I feel like April's a little bit of a push. It's a bit optimistic. It is optimistic, isn't it? Like I might be being cynical and it might all be uh, fine by then, but uh, yeah, <laughs> right it now. Might. It's it's like, I guess it's good in a way to be optimistic about it, but like still with something where it's like it's supposed to be a celebration and a happy thing rather than like an essential <sighs> don't know i think it's interesting though especially considering like it's alongside like the olympics isn't it that's being yeah. postponed mm. rather than you know like even if you think of the red carpet and if you've seen pictures of like the press they're all so rammed in together that there's impossible to social distance now or anything like that and i mean doing it with celebrities is fine but like in the auditorium with the seats how do you do you tell people you can only have one person come do you tell people have to come by themselves it just it it's not going to be what it normally is if they do it in April, I think. But that's probably why it's probably good to sort of delay it because um, it's just not going to be that big spectacle as it would be. No. Imagine if it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe people would like want it to be delayed in any way and like have it still be the same rather than moving it online. I, I guess that's like personal preference and everything, maybe, but. I don't know. Just speaking of kind of like things that have maybe moved online or in this case lack thereof, like San Diego Comic Con has been is announcing like San Diego Comic Con at home, which is going to be a virtual replacement for the iconic summer convention. And Peter's put a note on this saying, "Can we expect film trailers?" <laughs> so <laughs> I, it's just I think that's very exciting. Like I've obviously never been to San Diego or anything, but I love cons and everything. So I, I and I've never been into an online one or anything like that so but I think it is it's a very different kind of an event than the Oscars to put on online it seems more possible but even I don't I don't know what do you guys think about that um, 
I think in terms of like, you know, a lot of cons you have uh, panel shows and stuff. That's stuff that we've seen lots of online already since the start of lockdown. So I think that's that's one thing that can be transitioned quite easily. In terms of other stuff going on, um, I think that depends a lot more because you have a lot of people that rely on being at cons and selling things. And that's like quite a significant amount of either what they do for fun or stuff like that. And that's what they enjoy the cons for. And if they can't do that, really, it changes it quite a lot, I think. Definitely. Exact same with cosplaying, isn't it, right? Like, it's not quite the same because, like, you kind of rely on, like, a financial element to it if you're a seller at a con. But, like, so much of, like, probably, like, more than half the people at any of those cons are always dressed up. So, like, yeah. that pretty much take like you could still dress up at home and it'd be fun but you're not going to get like recognized you're not going to get pictures yeah you, like, you miss the whole sort of community aspect of it which is yeah. huge definitely yeah. but yeah um jurassic world dominion is to start reshooting in july uh since the pandemic most films have been pushed back but there have been encouraging signs of restarting production one of which being the avatar sequel that's still like starting to come back into action with its filming. Uh, there's a quote from this article that I read saying, Dominion will be the first major film to resume work in the UK. They're spending about five million on safety protocols and have been working with the British Film Council to make sure that the, these safety precautions are up to standard, um, which we talked about a little bit, I think two weeks ago, these like standards of sort of, you know, they're more like guidelines than anything else, but five million on safety equipment is quite a, I mean, does that sound like a substantial amount? Does that sound like too much, too little? Like, particularly when these things that they're going off of are guidelines, you know, and plus shooting um, a fiction film like that, and it's such an intense, big shoot where you're going to have lots of people on a set at any one time. That just, just, I don't know. What do you guys think about those major productions like Avatar and Jurassic World Dominion? I mean, spending about five million so I guess that's good but I still think it's quite early to sort of set it up at July um yeah I suppose the thing is is as long as it's being done safely and it can you know it can be proved to be safe it's quite a it's quite a good idea really to to get it done in terms of you know the the economy of the industry and for um it means they'll be able to release uh, a lot sooner than you know they would do if they had because if they if they were to wait until full lockdown because it would be months before they could start anything yeah. and you look at other things like you know there's a lot of sports being restarted at the moment and it's it, if you can restart sports then i would say it's quite feasible that you can restart shooting films because it's again you know they're in sports without crowds you, you don't really have crowds at a film shoot in terms of people going watching and the only thing you have to be aware of is the people making the film are putting themselves at more risk yeah definitely i think that's i mean really i don't even i don't even want another Jurassic park world whatever they're called <laughs> film so i'm like just stop shooting it's fine we don't need it but... do you not want to know what happens like now that but... the dinosaurs are are off and just no <laughs> i think we established that building a park is a bad idea <laughs> and I think we should have just left it at that. <laughs> but I guess with that kind of film as well, a lot of it is CGI. Um, mm. And hopefully that's something that they will have gotten done over lockdown. So maybe now all they'll be filming is actually inserting live action bits into that. And it might come back if cinemas reopen. It might be one of the new films, but... I suppose that's quite I similar to, to Avatar as well. Mm. In that... You know, it's heavily CGI, so they can probably do the bare minimum in terms of live shooting compared to a lot of other films that will be mostly on set. Definitely. Uh, the next piece of news is that, like, sadly, Sir Ian Holm has passed away and he was age 88. He's probably most notably known for his role as Bilbo Baggins in the, in the Peter Jackson series of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He was an interesting actor, I found out, because I read, I think that it was The Guardian that did an article on him. You know, like when famous people die, they always do a sort of like nice little description of their life and everything. Um, he's interesting because I found out that he actually had a really paralyzing stage fright. 
which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. He apparently, he took really long absences from theatre work. And when he did those, he sort of started to lean more into um, film work and stuff, which I think is very interesting because like, I've never heard of an actor. I've heard of like more sort of introverted actors or ones that don't really like the spotlight as much in the sort of the celebrity aspect of being yeah. there. I've never heard of somebody sort of like, I don't know if it's panic attacks as such or anything, but it's this like paralyzing stage fright of like, I just can't go out. Have you guys ever heard of anybody with this kind of a thing? Not particularly. It's, it's not something you kind of relate to. You relate to, you know, the idea of someone who is an actor is they are quite a confident person, especially for um, stage work yeah. is you know that that sort of thing where you've got you know actors comedians anyone who performs in front of people they have you, you just imagine them to have complete confidence in what they're doing Definitely. so to hear something like that is quite surprising more than anything especially for someone who is such a well-regarded actor as well yeah, definitely. Like even even though his probably like most famous role was just that kind of like fairly small role in Lord of the Rings movies, he mm. still was actually peppered into lots of things that I didn't realise. And it, like in Alien and stuff, it's yeah, it's crazy. But he did actually die peacefully in his sleep, and it wasn't coronavirus related, which is cool. That sounds like a really bad sentence, to say, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's peaceful. It's kind of the best way if you were gonna like. Anyway, let's keep, let's get off this subject. Um, as Peter mentioned in the last episode, David Kopp, who was the writer of, of if I'm saying that right, it's K-O-E-P-P, -P, who was the writer of Invisible Man that came out recently, um, is still working on a Bride of Frankenstein reboot. Um, the MCU style dark universe that Universal were working on did somewhat collapse when, after the failure of the reboot of the new The Mummy movie that had um, Tom Cruise in it since it was such a failure at the box office. I didn't even see it. Did any of you guys see it? No. 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 Um, it was, um, anyway, the new movie that they're getting, this Bride of Frankenstein one, is not, quote, Cup said, it's not the big $150 million extravaganza that the mummy was, but, and it's not as scaled down as The Invisible Man. It's much more reasonable and doable. So I guess kind of a middle ground. I'm certainly interested in this. Are you guys? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'll, in, I'll in go a for way, it. Yeah. Wait, pa Patrick, you go first. <laughs> I was, I was saying, I suppose, it, in a way, it's it's nice to see things like it and being reimagined, but at the same time, it's probably not the biggest sort of focus of mine, at least. Yeah, Patty, what were you going to say? I mean, I never got to see The Invisible Man because the last film I saw in the cinema was The Hunt and I still regret that. Um, but I, I would watch it, but they need to stop copying the MCU because it just, it's not working in their favour. Because Suicide Squad was like, oh yes, let's get all these bands to do covers of really good songs and it will be like Guardians of the Galaxy, but better because all these bands have done them. And then that didn't work. Um, <laughs> and it's... It's just not working out for them. They need to figure out what they're doing. But who knows? It might might end up lovely. And well not lovely, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Carl? I mean, I'd give it a chance. Um definitely Suicide Squad was not really a good movie, but I mean there there's always a chance that like I guess I hope they've sort of learned from the past, hopefully. Um yeah. yeah. You would hope so. And also, like, so. they're going off of, like, this really old material that's, like, this classic kind of horror and everything. And, mm. I mean, I've heard that Angelina Jolie is eyed to play the the bride, like, the main title character. So, like, I don't... I can't really imagine it. I, <laughs> that's my problem. I'm excited, but I can't really, like, even think what it would be like, especially if it's not on the scale of The Mummy, but it's not, also not as sort of, like, small scale as the uh, invisible man which i didn't actually see either so i but from what i've seen of trailers and what i've heard it's fairly like small story mm. so intriguing but so who knows um 
Ewan McGregor um, is going to be voicing Jiminy Cricket in Guillermo del Toro's uh, Pinocchio film. I think, Tati, did I see you tweet about this at some point? I, I did. It. Yeah, I thought... I, <laughs> um, I did not call it. Excited? Weird feelings? What does everyone think? Guillermo del Toro, I mean, that makes me excited. And, like, Ewan McGregor is great. So, like... So, <laughs> it's set in 1930s fascist Italy, which is just <laughs> interesting in itself. Um, and it's based off the book, uh, which was by an Italian author and originally published in Italian. And it's, like, some, like, dark fantasy remake of it. And I think Jiminy Cricket might have a song Ewan McGregor hinted that he had to record something where he was singing, but he wouldn't reveal it. And it's just all a bit bizarre. And it's stop motion animation. Like the whole thing is just, what? <laughs> and I think Disney are doing their own live action remake of Pinocchio, I think, which just makes it even more confusing. That's such a mess. It just sounds <laughs> incredibly convoluted. Like, I mean, I, I, I love him as an actor is great but that whole idea just sounds insane <laughs> it's like, like we know we know Guillermo del Toro can be like quite good with sort of historical movies and everything like exactly mm. like you know Pan's Labyrinth and everything but like I mean the bird devil's backbone but like it's sort of it still sounds like when Hattie said that I was like oh <laughs> yeah like, no it's not <laughs> Yeah, and stop motion animation, that's great as well. Like, I, every, you know, loads of people like that, but like, <laughs> it just sounds like a crazy movie, especially if Disney are going to do one as well. Like, if mm. one, they're going to be released in, say, a couple of years of each other. Because like, I started researching it, and the Disney one came up, which I think was supposed to be released later this year or something. Mm. And then, but I reread, like, the actual article I was supposed to be writing and it was like Del Toro and I was like well that's a different and I had to google a whole separate thing but it's coming up next year if everything goes to plan on Netflix it's just wow it's bizarre but I can't wait to be honest I definitely want to watch it that sounds <clears throat> really, yeah interesting and um, the final bit of news before we get into our main topic of conversation is that it's been a really big week for Oscar Isaac um who has been you know everyone knows Oscar Isaac um he's been cast alongside Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway for a movie called Armageddon Time he's starring in a Ben Stiller directed movie called London from the screenwriter of Forrest Gump who's called um Eric Roth um he's been cast in a gambling thriller called The Card Encounter and finally he's going to be in the Dune remake which is doing its reshoots in August but the release date hasn't actually moved for Dune's Dune's release, which is going to be the 18th of December of this year. Which again, I'm quite surprised at. I feel like I only started oh, hearing news about it very recently. I mean, it's definitely a bold choice not to push it back, that one. Um, they might do it. Who knows? I feel like um, I never really, I kind of knew of Dune just because of the fact that I like David Lynch. I'd never really heard of it outside of being like a fan of Lynch movies. And I, I only saw it like a couple of weeks ago. But do you really think it's going to be one of those movies that people, obviously Dune has got such cult <coughs> fans and like people who love that film. But like, do you think, it, considering they're not changing the release date, is it really going to do very well, considering, like, if not many people are going to go and it's already not exactly, like, a super, yeah. super mainstream type of sci-fi movie in of itself? It's got high build cast and people that people are interested in are trending at the moment, like Timothy Chalmay and everything, but I would be nervous if I was them, you know? I, I would definitely pin it as a massive risk to release it so early, because, I mean, even on terms, I mean, I, I think we've had in the last couple of, weeks or something, Cineworld has said they're going to reopen. But, you know, I don't have much intention to go to the cinema at any time soon, really. And I think quite a lot of people will be in the same position. And people in general won't, might not feel safe going to the cinema. Yeah. So to, to have them, even, even with, you know, that sort of cast like that, it's not, it's just, it's just risky in terms of whether... Because otherwise they'll have to keep it in cinema for a very long time. Yeah, that's true. I don't know how that will work because, yeah, I don't know. I feel very nervous about it. 
you'd think they'd wait two months yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe they're thinking Doing like no sorry Hattie you go <laughs> Doing Oscars just push it back two months <laughs> and then if it's still there push it back again it just yeah. <laughs> well um I don't know well now it's time to get into the actual what what people are here for I guess um so I'm gonna do a really quick history lesson on documentary films before we get into everything um so obviously the definition of a documentary film is a non-fiction film that is tended to quote um document reality primarily for the purposes of instruction education or maintaining historical record um and it's actually quite interesting the fact that it kind of like came about at the same time as fiction film they're very much like on the same path at the same time like some of the most sort of like commonly considered to be first movies ever are really documentaries like the train arriving in La Croix in from 1895 uh, the workers leaving the factory um from France in like 1896 or something like that they're all just documents of people doing things they're not like constructed ideas like the but of course things did come about at that same time like the Melier stuff like trip to the moon and things like that so they very much came about at the same time as fiction movies did um multiple different styles emerged early on in like the sort of 1920s when sort of like film generally started to become a bit more um, specified in what kinds of genres and what kinds of styles you could do so for example romanticism in documentary which are staged romantic films a good example of this is Nanook of the North, which was made by Robert Flirty. Um, it, I know Carl is going to know all of this because this is just stuff we both learned in school. But um, <laughs> it's quite interesting, that film, because it's made in 1922. Um, and obviously the people in it are the people, they're like Inuit people, I want to say, from 1922 but they asked them to do things that Inuit people would have been doing in about 1822, not 1922. So it's quite interesting because it sort of is a document, but it's not of that reality as such. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think about that, by the way, as like a concept? Obviously, it's a long time ago that was done now, but like, I mean, yeah. I suppose the thing is, is you get a lot of documentaries nowadays that have as part of them you know, there'll be, be a historical documentary, say, on the Roman era. And then they'll have as part of it, like, a recreation, which is obviously, like, I mean, we have no idea, realistically. But it's, it's it doesn't, that doesn't make it not a documentary. Yeah. So absolutely. I suppose it's kind of makes sense. But whether that stems from that or not is a, probably a good question. Yeah. I think, yeah, like, and people would never nowadays watch a Roman documentary and think, those are Roman, like you wouldn't, it doesn't yeah. enter your mind. Whereas like, I, I suppose maybe that's the difference that he was, Flirty was, Flaherty was pretending that it was how it was. Whereas in those reconstructions, they like, you know, everybody, it's kind of yeah. on board that it's a reconstruction, but you're right that the principle is the same. It's trying to illustrate something that they pretty much know for a fact and want people yeah. to kind of see. Um, another style that emerged back in the 1920s was um, a city symphony, which was influenced by like avant-garde kind of modern art movies and like general modern art of the time. A good example of that being what is widely considered to be kind of the most, like the best documentary ever made, which is D Diga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera from 1927. Again, Carl's nodding, he knows all of this. <laughs> um, I really like City Symphonies, but you don't see, in, like they're very poetic and I guess like they're just not the sort of thing you ever really see usually. Carl, do you want to say something? Yeah, um, poetic is quite a weird documentary esque thing like it's quite creative in a sense like it doesn't tell you what the truth really is like it doesn't directly tell you what it is and I guess that's what makes it quite different to other documentaries is that it's quite subjective highlighting that every choice that you make as a filmmaker is affects your whole film really like it, it really emphasizes that choice um yeah and the one of the final the, well there's two more I suppose Kino Pravda which was a sort of thing that emerged under Soviet kind of filmmaking, which is the idea, Kino Pravda translates to cinematic truth, which were movies that were made under the Soviet ideology of the time, but were like, so they were very like, this is exactly what it's like to be here and everything. And of course, part of that was like, it fit in with the, just the Soviet ideology of like, this is how we live, we're proud of it. This is kind of, we don't want to pretend to be something else or aspire to be something different 
uh, you know. And then the final one, which uh, is the most kind of, maybe not long lasting is the right word, but is the newsreel tradition, which kind of started in the 1920s, but sort of only really ended towards like the late 60s, which was where they would have newsreels of like, um, or just news events on in the cinema. Like a great example of it is like, if you go around a tour of Tyneside, which you guys might have done, they have like, they show you what like a news, an example of a newsreel that they would have shown. And so these used to happen like really often and they were just news stories or items of topical interests. I remember that my dad told me that his Nana once saw like, so this is confusing. My dad's uncle, would it have been? was in the war and he like they saw a video of him on one of these newsreels once when they like went to the cinema to see these newsreels so it's very cool and like kind of part of this like interest in kind of human sort of like documentary but news kind of there's somewhere in the transcendent transcendence from like news reporting to kind of like newsreel documentaries i think it's a real shame they kind of don't really exist anymore but i suppose would i go to the cinema to see a newsreel would you guys go to the cinema yeah. to see a newsreel I suppose, I suppose that kind of, that stems from having television and news channels now, which you could argue are pretty much the same thing, especially if you've got like a 24 hour news channel is essentially the same thing, just they get it a lot quicker and yeah. they, they get, and you get it in your living room rather than going to a cinema. Yeah, definitely. I think they're cool, but like, and obviously, and they sort of died out in that 60s time so you're right it's kind of in the sort of same time that people were starting to get more television sets more mm. options for you know how to see any of this kind of news and everything and the final kind of piece of talking at you guys is that there are lots of different styles of documentary which i only really learned after i came to uni which was that these are just some of the lists that i'm going to I'll just tell you them all. So there's poetic, which I mentioned, which is kind of much more like based on visual things. There's not really much talking ever, or if there is, it's not really telling you something. It's more just like showing you a bunch of images of it. Expository, which is where somebody explains something, what's going on. Um, you know, classic kind of documentary thing of you have a narrator telling you everything. Observational, which is where a person basically plonks themselves down and just watches what happens. They don't really interact with the environment. They just see everything that happens and they put it on the film. Participatory, which is where a presenter or a person kind of like with alongside the crew will come and like interact with the people that they see. It might not necessarily be straight up like interviewing in the classical sense, but they might sit with them, talk with them, kind of be around them or whatever. And it's very similar to performative which is like where you have a person who is the presenter that's one of the key parts of the documentary styles so stuff like michael moore louis theroux where it's like part of the reason you watch it is the personality that is encountering and like engaging with the subject matter essayistic that speaks for itself interview which speaks for itself <laughs> dramatization or docudrama which is kind of similar to what um Patrick was talking about where it's kind of like a construction of events that could have happened or somewhere in between the line of fiction and documentary. Mixed, which is obviously can be anything. And finally, an incredibly interesting form, which is the animated documentary, which like people do where maybe they're telling a story of their life or someone else's life, but they animate it instead of filming it. I've personally never seen an animated documentary of any of you guys. I've never seen, seen sorry, Carl. After you. No, no, you go. Okay, um, yeah, I've, I've definitely seen one in, um, oh, what's that, the Baltic Gallery, I think, um, it's like a self-portrait documentary about themselves, and it's quite animated in, like, game-esque fashion, which I absolutely, that's the first time I've seen it before. Um, I think it's quite good that they're really experimenting with documentary forms nowadays, because I think that what makes it quite unique from other pieces, I guess. Definitely. What were you going to say, Patrick? I was just saying that I'd definitely I had, i've never seen one but i definitely read about one and i when i was reading i think there's an article somewhere about how they're becoming a lot more uh common in sort of you're seeing a lot more of them now than there were i'm glad to hear that honestly because animation is just one of those things where like animated things never really even like main unless it's oriented very much at children and that's how it does well is like based on marketing and toys and things like that animations don't do well generally like in the kind of like 
box office, especially like stuff that maybe stop motion or line drawings rather than like CG or more common styles. So it's a real shame that there aren't more of it, but I guess you can understand why there isn't more of it because it's already documentary is not something that you see often in your cinemas, let alone animated documentary. Perhaps it bridges a gap though that people don't really know exists maybe. That whole yeah. list just like gave me flashbacks to a level film. And like, I don't even think we mentioned animation. I don't even think it was something that was brought up. It was just yeah. like, leave it behind. But, <laughs> don't talk about it. <laughs> just don't talk about studying film at A-level. Just leave it. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's cool. But I guess my next question is, guys, how did you guys become interested in documentary films and watching documentaries and engaging with them? Carl, would you like to go first? Um, well, I basically did it um, for university. Um, that was the first time I sort of got interested in it. Um, and then I made my first documentary first year. It's quite just observational sense of place. Um, it's quite, and that's how I began to just love it. Like how it's quite interesting that everything that we watch, even fictional stuff has influences from documentary. Um, like you always see observational stuff in every in any film. Um, there's always a scene where there's literally nothing happening, just watching it, and it's quite it's quite influential for that reason. Um, yeah. Was there a reason that you decided you wanted to do specific? Like Newcastle Uni is interesting in its mm -hmm. film course because it pretty much doesn't cover. It does cover fiction in modules where you can study, say, world cinema and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. it's mostly you make documentaries rather than fiction films, which is quite an unusual choice for a uni. Was there a particular reason you thought I want to do documentary making rather than fiction making, or was it just a general kind of a preference? I think it was just a general kind of preference, really. Um... Looking at like other universities and what they offer, um, Newcastle's quite good because um, they do half theory and half practical, which I really enjoy doing rather than just doing straight practical. Yeah, definitely. Hattie, what about you? How did you get interested in documentary films? I think uh, I need to blame A-levels again, uh, <laughs> which is fun um, because as I was saying to Kat when we found out the theme, um, in my second year we knew we had a new teacher coming in and he was supposed to be doing the documentary module with us and then like revising some other films that we didn't do a lot of in first year and we thought he was going to come in and start on the revision because we had mocks no one knew what they were doing and he comes in and he's like okay guys we're going to start your iranian cinema module today and i was like Sorry, what? <laughs> um, and we studied an Iranian documentary, uh, which I actually really enjoyed, enjoyed and didn't expect to do at all. Um, and then realised that I might as well watch some other ones that might interest me slightly more. Um, but sort of fell down a rabbit hole. <laughs> so, your, so your first yeah. introduction and thought of why I should watch these more was this random Iranian thing that you were showing? Pretty, pretty much. That's like... <laughs> The, it was really good, like nice. It's called it's called Taxi Tehran, and this filmmaker. It's very illegal to film a lot of things in Iran, uh, as you can imagine. And he's been in prison like six times for filming these things. Um, and he poses as a taxi driver and he drives around, and everyone has these moral discussions um, about like life and feminism and money and government, and um, it's really interesting but made me realise how little I know about anything. <laughs> um, yeah, he made a film called This Is Not A Film, put it in a USB stick, baked it inside a cake and sent it to America to get screened because he couldn't screen it in a run. <laughs> what? <Wow. laughs> oh my God. That's pretty cool. Uh, That's amazing. He's got a film called Offside. The last time I checked, I think it was somewhere available online, um, but it was based off his daughter I think or a member of his family because it's illegal or it was at the time for women to go to football matches um, and it was about this group of women that all dress up as men to get into a football match at the stadium but they all get caught and it's about what actually happens outside of the stadium uh, and watching them play out but like he's just incredible he's so good like That's so, so cool. awesome. and then I watched a load of other things <laughs> that was like the, the moment where I realised I did not know enough about documentary films. Or... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just, wow. 
What about you, Patrick? Yeah. Mine's mine's nowhere near as interesting, really. Um, <laughs> it's just I I've watched a couple and I enjoy I just enjoy learning things, so I just watch yeah. them. It's purely out of a uh, interest, I suppose. Mm. In, in I suppose it's more an, an interest to learn stuff, but not have to then be tested on it. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably yeah, <laughs> the thing behind it. And they're so accessible because they're only like an hour or two hours or something hour, and, you hour and, so half, much, yeah. and they're so yeah. fun and like unless you get an incredibly boring one which we are going to get onto in, <laughs> in <laughs> 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 but yeah no I I think the way I started watching them was mostly like through the fact that my parents really liked them so like they we would watch like BBC short ones that were on like history or like art or something like that maybe when I was like 11 12 ish and then that's kind of and then from there I got really into like stuff that people make on YouTube you know like um I guess because they do count like stuff like BuzzFeed Unsolved and like Defunct Land and ones that were like made by companies in the US but uploaded onto YouTube like medical ones have you guys seen the like vast massive amount of like medical documentaries there are on YouTube Patrick's nodding they're so like weird aren't they that's good that's so neat There's some some are great and some are <laughs> not amazing like there is there is all sorts but some of them are absolutely horrific <laughs> As, <laughs> as I will come on to in a bit. They're uh, kind of like, oh gosh, yeah. They're like, yeah. there's this kind of, there's if like, when they're somewhere in between like a medical documentary and like a TLC kind of like thing of like, my husband is whatever. And it's kind of like, it's some, just, I don't know. They're very funny, but they're very weird at the same time. Like, I think they're great though. It's really cool that there's so much more access to watch stuff like that, that like you may never see, even if like they aren't as fantastic as like other really, really well constructed stuff. It's still cool, but. Um, so it's time to move on to what some of our favorite documentaries. And uh, the first person I've got actually up on my notes to talk now, but you don't have to like do it if you don't want right now is Hattie, because she was going to tell us a little bit about some of her favorites. And the first one I'm oh. interested in is the fact that you said you, really like Louis Theroux stuff because yeah. I think like it's very like a lot of people do don't they like it there's such a fan base for Louis Theroux I, like he's very easy to watch and very like entertaining and everything yeah like, can you tell me a little bit about like, what it is about him that you like or like this the style of his stuff that you like particularly so I think the first one I saw was the one on Westboro Baptist Church I think because I'd seen some of it online and was like I need to watch this and then when I went to LA last year, I got shouted at by them, which was an experience. There was, How are you shouting I, think, at? I think it was like one of the new members, but they, they had the signs and they had the big like speakers and everything. And my film teachers were like, just stay away. But I was like, I want to do something very feminist and very strong right now. <laughs> and I just carried on walking. Um, I, I find this stuff really, really interesting. I think he's really engaging. And in terms of like, he always tries to look, especially in those ones, like the series he did over, must be like six years now at least. Um, he tries to look for the good in them and is like, okay, from the outside, we see them as like ridiculous people who aren't really thinking straight, don't really think about other people and what they're doing is really horrible. But he goes in and he's like trying to have an open mind and just being like, okay, like, I'm going to connect with you on a human level and try and see how that goes. And he genuinely, like, kudos to him for doing it because I think most of us would go in kicking and screaming and <laughs> being shocked. But, yeah, and he's... I mean, they're just some of them are just funny. But um, There's an off-Broadway one. I can't remember which season it's in, but it's on uh, Netflix. And he goes and he gets so involved and he actually does an off-Broadway audition for this musical that's on a cruise. Um, and they have to give him like proper feedback, like it's a real audition. <laughs> and it's just sat, you're cringing so much because it's so bad. But it's so like, that's just, I think it's amazing that he just throws himself into it. Because I think lots of filmmakers would just try and be on the sidelines a bit more. Yeah. 
I think BBC people are especially like when they're a presenter like that, they're quite, they're, they often, I think his thing is like, he's very like, not monotone, that's the, but that's not the right word to describe him. But like, there's something about like a neutralness that like leads him through. He's kind of like got these looks and he like uh, invites the audience to have a perspective on it and like decide for themselves. But obviously there is always, you're right. He comes into it with a, the audience and I are kind of on the same page here. Let's go into this and like, yeah kind of cover it rather than like being an expert on whatever subject that he goes into finding out about which i think is quite accessible for people because you sort of yeah like you feel like oh we're, and we're on the same page here so when you're when you can stay calm i i, I can just be shouting at the screen like what are you doing like whereas I mean, he says yeah have you seen the uh ufo episode with that no. <laughs> oh strongly recommend if you need to laugh because he some of the reactions that people have they, there's one bit, I don't want to ruin it, but they're trying to contact the alien species that is living above their house. And uh, <laughs> they have a certain reaction to it. And Louis is just trying to keep this straight face, but I was in tears for about <laughs> 10 minutes after because I just couldn't stop laughing. And yeah. I felt so bad because I was like, you have to be respectful because you're in their home and they very strongly believe in everything that's going on. But I can't <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's brilliant i don't know how he does it and what about um some of the ones that you mentioned as like the longer form stuff that you told me about like knock down the house faces places and hail satan you can pick one of those or you can talk about all of them just like whichever one you think kind of is like the one that you'd like to speak about right now um i think knock down the house is just amazing um like in following um I think it's four or five women uh across states in America trying to become I think it was governors of like districts or senates I can't remember um and eventually AOC gets the one seat but it's like really powerful in terms of just feminist and like a bit like becoming a bit like feeling strong after you watch it um and faces places just as like an arty film but I love Agnes Varda I think she's amazing she's so cool I want to grow up to be like (laughs) (laughs) she's just amazing um and Hail Satan is a really weird one uh that sounds absolutely bizarre but is really interesting in sort of the satanic movement in America I can't remember how I came across this I think I read a review somewhere I was like oh that sounds cool just watch that um and was like not what you're expecting at all um because actually they're really liberal and they fight for like equal rights with race and religion and gender and sexuality for everyone they're so open um they believe in like freedom of speech um and they're trying to like they're in a lot of conservative states as well so there's one of their main goals in the documentary is they're trying to get a satanic um statue next to the Ten Commandments statue outside this democratic building in America and all the Christians are like well no like you can't have that there and they were like yeah but this is our religion and this is freedom of speech so either we have both the statues or we have neither um and you're like fair argument but you can see that all like all these white cis um people are just panicking because they've come in and they're like well that's not quite fair like we need to change that Mm. um so they're not as like radical as you would think they don't say i don't think they say to like worship satan they sort of try to reflect liberal and equal values but it's really good and not as weird as it sounds (laughs) i like it's also got a question mark at the end hasn't it exactly (laughs) you'll say that's really nice and lighthearted. i love stuff like that where they can be a bit tongue-in-cheek about like this as an idea but they still give it a platform to kind of like yeah. you do take it seriously you don't just think what like that's really dumb but yeah well that's really good um what about you patrick you listed iraq in fragments as you one of your favorite documents. yeah i mean i was toying with the idea of saying a throat and um, because I, I do completely agree with you is the way in which he sort of presents it it's kind of it's on a learning and he's learning with you and that's i think that's a really great way of doing it but um, Iraq and Fragments is, I just, I really like it. It's because it's such a, like, down-to-earth sort of way of looking at things, I think. I mean, it was all filmed on a camcorder. 
in occupied post uh, liberation Iraq, and it followed like three sort of different groups. So it was um, Shiite Muslims, uh, Kurdish farmers, and then like a uh, a boy um, who was trying to find. I, I think it was it was trying to find his father. If I remember correctly, it was a, quite a while ago, but it just left such a lasting image because it was just such a great and interesting uh, documentary to watch. I've never seen it, which I'm sad about because it sounds really good. I did take tiny weeny bits of research and it got, it won awards at Sundance for like editing, yeah. cinematography, directing, like none of the other ones we've it's... got mentioned <laughs> are that powerfully like, you know, acclaimed. I think that's very impressive. It is really good and I would highly recommend it to people uh, to go and watch because it's just such a different sort of outlook on the on the country as a whole of Iraq because you a lot of what you see is from the news and a lot of what you see is about the war and everything like that and it's just kind of a much more personal and I suppose intimate but that's not the right word um, sort of view of the country. Does it follow individual kind of like stories that are kind of supposed to like encompass kind of an experience of certain people in there? Like it does it, I think it read it, it follows three people, doesn't it? And yeah, it's, yeah. so it's, it follows, um, it, it follows a, a young boy, as like I said, um, and then it also follows a farmer and I cannot remember, but it's some, it's, it's a Shiite Muslim and it's kind of, it just shows that their sort of everyday life and what they're kind of, trying to find and do with their life uh, especially like against the sort of hardships that they're facing what is it about that one of like the ones that you've like documentaries that you've seen that kind of like sticks it out to you the most is it kind of the subject matter or the way in which that it was made that it was, was made? kind of a combination of both um the way it was made is just it it makes it so much more interesting because it's not like it doesn't it's professional but it's also kind of not the same if that makes sense it's just got a different sort of feel to it and i suppose it's probably the more personal level and then the subject matter itself is just so interesting because of the the difference of a, the difference it shows you compared to what it normally you, you normally see that sounds really but, yeah. cool. i'm gonna put that on my watch list that sounds good what about you carl you've listed a couple to me that you really really like so would you like to tell me about whichever one you're like quite keen on yeah um I'm torn between two of them. Actually. Um, I'm not stop thinking anymore. Um, cool. Um, I really like Tarnation. Um, Tarnation by um Jonathan Clouet. It's a really um, eh, yeah. It's it's quite like a self-portrait documentary talking about himself, which might be perceived as like quite narcissistic at times. But I think what makes it quite different is that he realizes things about himself, which he sort of does throughout the journey of the film. And I think he's only spent about yeah, two hundred eighteen. US dollars to make the whole film, which is quite, you know, it's quite inspirational for a filmmaker to spend that much, well, less, it's less um, budgeting than other films that we see. He made it on something like crazy small, like he made it on something like Movie Maker or something, wasn't it? The editing software was like stuff that comes free with like whatever computer you get and stuff. It was incredibly like small budget, but really powerful film, isn't it? Like, what is it about like, can you tell us a little bit about like the way it's made? Because obviously it's very different to some of the other kind of movies that we've mentioned here. Yeah, it's it's sort of um, it's like discovering. Um, I think it was discovering her mom's, his mom's um, mental um, problems. I think where they came from, and it's quite it's quite emotive because we we see a lot of this person just interacting with the camera. I mean, it's not like Louis Thoreau in that sense that he's like talking with the camera as well, but like it's more personal. It's like you can really see like, the whole sort of aspect of this person, like the whole backstage and the front stage is like all together in there. Mm -hmm. um, and what's quite interesting as well is that this guy has done like a lot of acting stuff um, before the yeah. film. He really uses it. I'm like, is this staged? Because I'm like, <laughs> 
He had this really interesting play that he did in high school, wasn't it? Where it's something like Blue Velvet, the the, the musical, or Blue Velvet, the theatre play that he had like written. Right, I know. It's such a bizarre. He's it's what? such an interesting person. This guy that made it actually like based off the David Lynch film. I think it was either Blue Velvet or something else. I'm quite sure it was Blue Velvet though, but it's certainly <laughs> a Lynch movie. I can't I kind of want to see it for the chaotic energy, but he, I kind of want to stay far to, away. He puts a couple of clips of it in Tarnation itself, like, but not very much. When he's just kind of explaining I need to watch what it's like. Very good. <laughs> but yeah. And also I think Tarnation, when I watched it, Carl, I it's very deeply like sad, isn't it? Like it's very like the whole time you're watching it, you're like it's just so emotional. So I very like, even though I've never remotely gone through the same kinds of things he has, he expresses like how he, you know, the frustration or the sadness or the confusion so well in the way that he kind of puts it together in a way that you don't really often see in documentaries because it's sort of just, it's the way he's kind of edited it rather than like, and it's from him himself. It's like such a, um, expression rather than mm. and that sounds dumb because all documentaries all films are expressions in whatever form they are but his somehow because it's such a personal story like you say it's just so poignant and sad and mm. very impactful yeah. yeah i'm not sure where he is now but i'm pretty sure he's done a second part of that documentary um with his mother again so it's quite he uses a lot of his family stuff in his documentaries from what i know anyway yeah um, yeah what about oh. Man on Wire? What is it that you like about Man on Wire? Oh. I've never seen it. It was one of those ones I didn't get a chance to see it. What did you think? And what's it about, by the way? For... Um, Man on the Wire. Um, it's, it's this guy trying to um, cross off the two bridges in um, the 9-11, uh, what's it called? Twin Towers. Um, and basically, um, talks about the journey that he tries to go through, um, how he gets through the construction of the building and all that stuff. Um, but what's quite interesting is that it mixes up the narrative quite, it is very strange because it mixes it like, you know, the ending from the very start, but then it cuts it again and then it starts again. And it's like, it's quite a disjunctive narrative, which I, I haven't really seen in documentaries before. It's quite confusing, but also quite um, emotionally um, engaging in that sense. That sounds really cool. And what about finally Entre à or oh. however you pronounce that, oh. I really don't know how you pronounce that. <laughs> It's a French movie. <laughs> um, yeah, it, to have and to have not, I think, it, um, in English. Um, no, to be and to have. Um, yeah, it's quite um, interesting because it talks about, like, the journey that these children go through from, like, kindergarten. Well, well no, it's, it's like a whole school journey, basically. And oh. it's, it's quite emotive because, like, I, I see myself in the in these characters and it's quite... Um, engaging in that sense he uses a lot of metaphors as well which a lot of documentaries do really really subtly um the use of um summer winter as a sort of like growing up and like evolving as a whole um it did have some ethical issues though hmm. do you want to tell us a little bit about the ethics? um because i'm pretty sure that the guy the, the teacher that they had um basically had a lawsuit lawsuit because um they he said that their images were not what they intended it to be. Um, and they, I think they tried finding the um, filmmaker because they, they, they sort of wanted like, this is performative, but like we're performing in a camera. But like, if you pay people that you're working with in a documentary, it's quite, I'm not, <laughs> I'm really not into that. It's a very difficult one, isn't it? Because he, in that, you're following such a, developmental stage of these children's lives and everything and that's what people are really interested in in the mm. documentary they're interested in seeing the growing up and the the fights and the kind of like friendships and everything of that they're not really like the teacher is obviously a part of it but it's not really like was it with it was that he had a problem with the way he was presented didn't he i can't quite remember yeah, whether he was presented so. in like a negative light or what it must have been fairly negative for him to <laughs> you know think <laughs> i should see you over this but it's a very tough one it's a real shame if like you're not on board with what is made about you like that must be very weird and disheartening as a subject in a documentary you know like because um they um yeah um they got sued over film profits so oh, um, they still made a lot more money than they thought yes yeah. um 
So that's probably why they're like, <laughs> well. <laughs> like, but he, instead of like defamation or like kind of like t tainting his character in a way they didn't like, it was more that they gave him not very much money because they thought the documentary wasn't going to make very much. Mm. And then it did end up making quite a lot. So that's interesting in of itself. I don't know. Like, I personally think Enter at War is like a good movie. I didn't like love it, but I thought it was like cool, definitely. Like, mm. I'd recommend people to watch it if you've never watched an observational film before. Because it is quite cool, isn't it? Like, it's yeah. sort of what it shows. And kids are interesting anyway, because, like, you all were one, but they're also young, and it's very, yeah, it's sweet. Um, but, yeah, um, I guess the next logical question is, what are your least favourite documentaries, and which ones that you think are particularly overrated, uh, maybe, if you have any that are listed? So I have Hattie up next to talk about... Um, one of whichever one of the movies that she wants, you listed a lot that you thought you didn't like or thought were overrated, actually. So go ahead, whichever one that you I want to jump on first. To watch the weird ones. Um, uh, I know everyone really loves the Blue Planet, but it's just never been for me. <laughs> what is that about I, it that you think is a bit meh? I love David Attenborough, I just I love him, but I can't get through it just like sends me to sleep I'm not gonna lie <laughs> like, I think because it's so nice to watch that I just have a nap uh, <laughs> do you think it's like, boring I'm... or is it like unengaging and everything or is it like struggle. relaxing Calming. I struggle with nature documentaries I see right. I do just I need stuff to be like happening mm. to hold my attention and if it's just like this is how this fish eats I'm like well, that's day-to-day -day life. What happens when it, like, can't find the food or, like, something like that? I don't know. It Maybe, like, one day I'll rewatch them and I'll be like, I was so wrong and I'll hate my past self. But right now it's just... Um, and the other one, like, on reflection, when I watched it, I really loved it. Jim and Andy, the one... I think we were talking about this, Kat, um, with Jim Carrey about his method acting in one of his films, I can't quite remember the name of it, um, but was, he was method acting like this real actor and it was based off his life um, and this real actor was horrible and a misogynist and just not a nice man to be around at all. So method acting him the whole time on set and off set made it really difficult and I think in hindsight, whilst I was like, this is really entertaining and quite funny. Um, I think it must have made it really difficult for everyone to be there and to be around and especially for the family to see that person that they knew who was related to them come back to life when he actually isn't alive is really creepy and I think just a little bit pretentious on Jim Carrey's part. Um, but yeah, it's... Do you, do you think that the film, because I, I saw it when it first came out and I'm just curious because I, I haven't seen it for a while, do you think that the reason that the documentary you're not like, a huge fan of it is the subject matter that you're not a fan of in that like you just find it uncomfortable or do you think the way the film handles it is a little bit like um, glorifying him a little bit too much for comfort considering how he kind of behaved and the kind of ethics of it really? Like what is it about it that you were kind of meh about? I think it's both. I think the very fact they made a documentary on it when yeah. it probably could have been an article or it could have been like a interview with Jim Carrey about it and literally just the whole like from what I remember I think there were interviews with people who were like on set and things like that but even then it never came to like any conclusion like this is right or this is wrong which I think sometimes documentaries need to do because I think they were posing the question like Jim Carrey did this here's how he did it, here's how it affected everyone. Is it right? Is it wrong? I think it was wrong, but they never sort of explicitly said. And I think it's hard as well when it's a company behind a documentary and it's not a voice. Yeah. Like with Fahrenheit 9-11, you have, is it called 9-11? Yeah. yeah. Um, you have that one voice and he's very distinct and you, you know it's him, but with a lot of other films, it's sort of someone behind the camera and it's, this hidden figure almost that you just don't know who they are and the opinion isn't there yeah 
I could totally agree with that. I, it, especially when I think we're more used to having people sort of tell us, not tell us what's right and wrong, but like at least yeah. make a stance on something, at least say, I think this is a bit iffy, don't you? <laughs> Whereas he, the people making that film, you very much feel like you're just watching stuff happen and like watching it. And perhaps maybe that's the point, but I can understand you, even if that is the point that you're supposed to make up your own mind, you can still feel uncomfortable at the way it yeah. was made, considering how sensitive the subject matter is. So it was just like heartbreaking watching some of it and like I don't want to ruin what happens but like there's certain scenes where you're like you really should not have gone and done that because morally speaking it's a bit questionable <laughs> yeah. um but when he's so deep into that mindset of someone else it's scary like he almost sort of seems to like lose his sense of who he is mm-hmm. and I can't I sort of feel a little bit of sympathy for him because like on rap day imagine going from a completely different person to Jim Carrey again and like yeah how do you do that (laughs) you're like every waking minute you're spending as this different man who was so horrible and then you have to like become your own self again it's really weird yeah I would recommend the movie just because I think so weird. I don't know. Have Patrick and Carl, have either of you seen it? I've not seen it, no. That's fair. I think it's a common thing with documentaries. That's why, like, it sounds like such a big show name to do, like, oh, we're going to cover all documentary films in this. But it's surprising how little crossover there is between what things people have seen and what they haven't seen. Like, most of these ones that you guys have listed, I haven't seen. So, and the yeah. only reason I've seen a lot of Carl's ones is because we're on the same course. So, like, <laughs> otherwise, we wouldn't probably have seen them. So, yeah, I don't know. But, anyway, um, what, any, any more that you want to talk about, Hassie? Because, of course, you had a couple of others. I'm quite intrigued to know your opinion on Fahrenheit 9-11 more so, because I sort of am in the process of watching it at the moment. And, of course, that's a legendary, like, I feel lots of people, even if they haven't seen it, they've heard of it. Have any of you guys see, that, That's one that I really want to see. That's, that's, that's sort of yeah. on my list, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, Hattie, what is it about it that you sort of thought was maybe a little bit overrated about it? I think that was the word you used, wasn't it, mm-hmm. rather than, like, disliking it? It's been a while since I've seen it, and I think it's one of those ones that, like, eventually I will come back to, but I just remember watching it and being like, it's just not for me. It's just not. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, I like political documentaries and things like that just from having watched like Knock Down the House and um, the Michelle Obama documentary and things like that. I love learning about how that all works. But I just found it a little bit like a little bit crazy. I just, it was a bit, <laughs> um, I mean, even the cover on Netflix for it, because it keeps coming up, is yeah. like, I think it's Donald Trump outside the White House and then like behind the White House is like an atomic bomb going off and I'm like and he uh, Donald Trump is playing golf as well this is how many times I've looked at it and thought (laughs) I should rewatch this and then I haven't and it's just it was one of those ones I was just watching and didn't I don't want to say vibe with because that's such a horrible (laughs) like it just didn't click with me which was a shame Happens a lot, though, I think, you know, yeah. something just doesn't quite click with you, especially if it's subject matter that you're just not particularly, like, either knowledgeable on or really that interested in. I think, especially with someone like Trump, where he's a very polarising personality and, you know. I think it's quite difficult sometimes as well to watch documentaries, uh, not singling him out, but yes, about him <laughs> um, and everything that goes on, because you hear yeah. so much of it in the media every day. Um, and then to sit down for like an hour and a half and watch a documentary on the absolute chaotic festival that is that house um, (laughs) is like a bit of a challenge almost Um, and I mean even if you do want to like learn something I feel like reading an article is slightly less painful Uh, (laughs) (laughs) and takes 10 minutes but you know it's important to watch stuff like that but not every day. <laughs> yeah, it takes a toll. And the final one you listed to me that you disliked, I'm assuming it's dislike <laughs> Behind the Curve, which I've seen, wowie, what a film. Can you tell us what Behind the Curve is about? Just for, by the way, for a scientist on the call. Oh, it's so fun. <laughs> um, 
it's about flat earthers isn't it (laughs) Mm-hmm. I genuinely don't know why I watched it to this day because my parents came <laughs> in and out of the living room whilst I was watching it. They were like, "What's this?" And I was like, "Oh, a documentary on flat Earth." <laughs> and they were like, "Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> Just weird, door." Um, I it's hilarious. I couldn't. It was that Louis Theroux moment where he's being really serious and taking it in and being really civil, and I'm sat on the couch laughing my head off and just completely in awe. Um, and it's about the like I think the main people that are heading up this movement or this society that they have Um, and it's almost like a business that they run and they go around America and they have this massive convention of flat earthers and everything like that and they're doing all these scientific tests to prove that the earth is flat and uh, interviewing people that go to the convention and they, they all believe it so strongly and they can't understand why they'd be wrong um and there's a wonderful bit right at the end that I think you should just watch the film for because it (laughs) I don't want to like spoil it again but it is it ends on that moment and (laughs) it's so good it's mad it's but I think it's a shock factor of it because it's someone so outside of like our beliefs and what we think uh that just I mean it was like watching the fire festival documentary I just was like what (laughs) you really I'm so annoyed that Andy didn't come to the student union um because I really would have gone to watch him talk one of the guys that was in that uh (laughs) it blew my mind how people could fall into that like belief that well, oh, this is going to happen and there's going to be all these eco-friendly tents everywhere and just the absolute disaster that it actually was. <laughs> is... I think Behind the Curve is a particularly like funny one because when I first watched I, I, I did not enjoy the experience of watching that film. Oh, and God, like, no. why I don't like... <laughs> but like, at the same time, it's not like one of those movies where you feel like they're trying to persuade you that something... Mm-hmm. They didn't feel like they were trying to persuade me that Flat Earth was a thing. They felt like they were showing me people that believe this thing. Mm-hmm. And then, like, the ending kind of proves that it's not wanting you to... The audience... It's not yeah. saying, audience, we think that flat uh, the Earth is flat. It's not saying that, is it? So my attitude to it is that, like, I don't mind it too much because of that. But at the same time, the actual subject matter is just so infuriating the whole time you're watching it that it just makes it very hard to watch. But yeah, have you, either of you two seen by the um, behind the curve? I mean, I feel like yeah, I have, and for the exact reasons that you're saying, I absolutely hate it because the the topic of it, and it's the same reason for the one that I've uh, I've got, is I just hate the material of it so much. Like it's so frustrating that I mean, I I couldn't finish that one, and the one I'm going to talk about, I couldn't finish either because it was just so bad. Yeah. In terms of, like, it was it, if you compare it to like a through one where he's trying to understand them, like, and whoever he's talking to, in in that, and um, it's just there's no sort of there's no balance to the argument. It's just kind of this is what we're going to show you. <laughs> there's no attempt to try and agree with it or to to try and help you understand why they kind of think that. If that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the, cate- so. the category I put it under was I don't actually know if I like this, but I laughed. Um, <laughs> it was just like that's the only way I feel like I could describe it because I would probably watch it again if I was like sad and just needed to laugh. <laughs> but <laughs> what was the one you want to tell us about, Patrick? It seems like a good uh, segue. Yeah, so, so the one that I want to talk about is, is, is called Vaxxed. Um, or vaxxed from cover up to catastrophe what a and name. <laughs> yeah it's quite recent and it's all about anti-vaxxing and it's been and it was made by the person who so there was um there was like a paper done years ago showing a link between the mmr vaccine and autism which is has been determined to be false and the guy who wrote it has been struck off uh, as a doctor and the guy who wrote it is the one who made this film <laughs> <laughs> and it is awful because it's it is just a film he has made to essentially try and promote anti-vaxxing 
and it's it's awful because that's just all the content it's in. It's, it's basically a propaganda film. Gosh. And it's technically a documentary, <laughs> but it's it's really not good. Yeah. It, it got removed from a few film festivals as well, uh, which is interesting. I guess but it's yeah. different to like when you there's straight up disagreeing with something and thinking like, eh, that's not okay. But then there's like a difference between somebody thinking, I don't really like disagree with the subject matter that you're kind of like dealing with in this movie or it's too sensitive versus like somebody almost like trying to pontificate a, a view upon the, yeah. view, like the audience. Like, I, I don't think I would, I genuinely don't think I'd have a problem with it as a documentary if it was made by someone looking at it. But it's the fact that it's the, the guy who did it, um, is it good? So he, because he directed it, it's the guy who essentially has caused the whole thing, has made it. It's very much, it's just, it's a bit of a sour taste to it. Yeah. Yeah. Not in More the same way Flat like Earth does, where it feels like the guys have taken the mick out of it a little bit. It's like, yeah. That. It's, there's no sort of, it is just, this is it, this is what I believe, this is what you should believe, and it's very much like, mm. and especially, mm. especially because I disagree with it so much as well, it just made it all the worse, and I could not finish it, because it's just like, I can't watch this. <laughs> is that on Netflix? Did you watch? Oh, sorry, Patty. No, is that on Netflix? Uh, it might be. I, I watched it a, like, a while back. I feel like I've seen it, and I genuinely thought it was about the opposite of that like viewpoint so i'm very glad i never watched it no they made they thought, made a sequel um so <laughs> that might be what you saw but I, I didn't watch that so i have no idea what it's about but i know they made i'm it. glad i skipped past it now <laughs> it's just it's not good how far into it did you get oh 40 minutes or so that's a fair innings i like, think yeah it's i mean it's i think it's, I think it's about an hour and a bit uh, long, but I just couldn't do any more. I was like, "This is too. It's too much. I can't even treat this with the sort of respect you need to to watch a documentary." It was like, "I can't. I just can't listen to it." I think something audiences appreciate uh, in documentaries, in for, certainly for like me talking from my perspective, is like feeling like somebody's like t telling me about something, but they're not talking down to me about it or trying to persuade yeah. me one way or the other especially with stuff like political stuff like obviously Fahrenheit 9-11 is obviously based on I we don't like Trump these are all the things that are bad about Trump look at yeah. how terrible Trump is whereas like and that is the same thing in its way but Fahrenheit 9-11 it's like t being told from not this person. It's like somebody, yeah, who's against them and you sort of take it with however much salt you need to. But yeah. like with something like that, it sounds like it's the problem with it is the nature of the fact that it's this person who's been disproved and who has yeah. dying on this hill. And it's like, why? <laughs> it's kind of, I think the, the, the sort of objectivity of it is probably the main thing. Um, and even, even if it's documentary like, persuading you I, I personally don't have a problem with that and um, yeah. it's more just as long as they show both sides or they show at least good sort of reasoning and explain it properly if that makes sense rather than just yeah. being like this is it you should probably listen to me and that be about science. it science like political views of course mm. there's there's an element of nuance of like what you personally believe is ethical and moral and kind of the best. Of course, yeah. Whereas with science, there is science and there is pseudoscience. There isn't an in between with science. That's it's the just, thing, and is I mean, it essentially was just a pseudoscience uh, documentary, which was just quite weird. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen anything like that. That sounds really weird no. and interesting. How did I mean, you, you come across it? I, I think someone sent it to me. Yeah. Um, I think we'd been talking about. Also, we've we've been talking about kind of conspiracy theories and stuff, okay. and they'd they'd sent it over, and I think it wasn't like a you should look at this. This is right. It was more they were just like, have you seen this? <laughs> and I was like, no, but I guess I'll watch it. <laughs> I guess I will. Um, yeah. yeah, and it was not good. Oh. Carl, what about you? What maybe do you like? Is your least favorite documentary or one that you think is quite overrated? Yeah. Um... Before that, I feel like I really need to see that one, Patrick. It's quite interesting yeah. about how it's, I, I don't know, I need to see it, but the fact that you hate it, it's quite interesting that like, it's quite like, comedic in a way. Was it intended to be comedic even, or was it just like a serious? No, 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 
there was there was no intent of comedy in it. It was <laughs> oh it, if if you can that's the thing is if it was framed as a haha look at this, I'd have maybe dealt with it. I don't agree with that like as a sort of thing that they should be doing. It's like if you're gonna you you shouldn't make a documentary just mock something because mm-hmm. if anything that'll it's with something like that it can put people more in their views of being like, well, everyone's against us, etc. Yeah. But if it was that, I could have at least probably watched it fully. Hmm. But it was just, it was, there was no sort of comedic aspect. It was very much a, this is fact sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, for my documentary, it's basically, um, I, not that I don't hate it, I sort of, I just, it's quite a long, disjointed narrative. Um, it's called Saint du Soleil by, um, I think it's called by Chris Mark, I think it was. It's, um, it's basically talking about like how human marriage is quite disjunctive and how it's different from perspectives in different countries. And it's like, it's quite, it's quite hard to sort of understand what he's trying to say. It's like an essay film. He's basically saying, this is what I think it is, but like he's mixing it up so many times. I'm like, Okay, um, now I don't get used to it. <laughs> probably um, that. It's very unusual. It's not mainstream. It's not easy to follow. Mm. It's not like at all. Films I don't like are ones that, like, I don't mind making a film to like get somebody to react to it. I don't mm. mind that. But what I do dislike is people making movies just. And like documentaries are especially good for this. It's like they make something that's purposefully really slow paced and hard to get into. It's like, mm. why? What? Why do you need to? Do? Like slow cinema is completely different. Like slow cinema, of course, like yeah, it's slow and it's purposefully trying to be thoughtful and kind of like meditating on what you're seeing and your surroundings and everything. But slow paced documentary that that just sounds really difficult to engage with. I feel like I did see it. That's why I'm like saying this because mm. I'm pretty sure from photos I saw when I looked up this, it seems I don't like as well. You're saying like it's the matter of human memory. It kind of fits with the yeah. idea of like, it's disjointed. It's hard to follow <clears throat> it's the epitome of like, but this is made with intention of being like that. Look how well it fits the narrative, but it's like, that doesn't make it good. What what is it about yeah. it that you is it the disjointed aspect of it that you kind of dislike, or is it the feeling of confusion or the way it's made? Like, I, I definitely get the intention there, but I feel like it's quite long to make it that intention. Um, it's it mixes so many times that like the the argument that he's trying to get yes, it's about human memories, but there's nothing more to that yeah. to develop with. Um, that's probably what I struggled with because um, I don't mind disjunctive narratives but when they're too disjunctive that's where I'm like what's, what's the point you're trying to sort of get in here? When it's a specific topic as well like a good, a good comparison that you could probably make is the one that Patrick said he really liked that Iraq in Fragments one because that's so, an area of something that people don't really know much maybe like some people anyway don't really know much about and obviously human memory isn't something that the general public just knows tons about and like so i feel like when if they did a kind of method like the one that patrick mentioned where they follow specific viewpoints on something or like maybe a specific person's experience of memory maybe like somebody who doesn't has a really strong memory or someone who has a really like and slightly more it's it sounds mean to say i want to do something that's a bit more mainstream take that thing that's avant-garde and make it more mainstream that sounds mean to do it but like you're the effectiveness of it like does that really will it really work if something's too hard to watch and just disengaging and like i just don't know what you're trying to say here because it's just so disjointed Hmm. yeah i suppose a significant thing you've got to think about is is the audience you know is the the reason you're making a documentary typically is to inform or show people something but if the people watching it can't follow or tell what's actually going on then what what's the point in you having made it you know yeah completely that does kind of like take me nicely onto my first kind of like this one of the two kind of discussion points that i'm intrigued to know you guys' opinion on which is the first one is i want to talk about how social media has affected documentaries as film you know as a art form 
Um, platforms such as YouTube have created an increased distribution area and ease of accessibility for creators and watchers of documentaries alike. It has led to boom in documentaries being made by anyone with a passion for the subject. Um, some notable examples that like certainly jump to mind when I think of YouTube documentaries are things like Shane Dawson. He's got 23 million subscribers and has made like you know, he's made stuff on Jeffree Star, he's made stuff on Jake Paul back in 2019 and 2018. He's most recently done a couple, like one, I think just a couple of days ago that was about like a demon in his like house, but he genuinely thinks that there is one, you know, and like what I'm intrigued to know is that with this increased accessibility um, of people making documentaries and ability to get it out there for new and different people to see that might not necessarily see stuff like BBC funded things that I used to see when I was 11, 12 and other things like that. Now that anyone has this platform, do you think that like, what's your kind of attitude to like, your sort of I'm trying to think of the exact way to phrase it because what I'm driving at is the fact that I wouldn't if I watched a YouTuber make a film I wouldn't treat that person with the same level of like sort of um specificity on like what they need to be saying is accurate as I would with say something that was made by Michael Moore or something that was made by the BBC like What's your guys' kind of attitude to this new boom in people seeing new documentaries from social media and from pretty much anybody who is willing to make it? Yeah, so so the way the way in which you phrase that is really important is that obviously you don't expect you're not putting the same sort of levels of sort of specificity and trust. essentially yeah. trust and correctness in it. But the problem I personally find with it is, is that not everyone does that. They're, you know, significant, not insignificant amounts of people do put a lot of trust into uh, those sort of sources, especially for news and documentaries and things. And that can lead to, I mean, I know we were, because we were talking about the, the maxing one, but there are lots of documentaries on YouTube about conspiracy theories and things, and you can end up going... You know, you watch one and you get more suggested and you go down to a hole and then suddenly it's all looking very possible and real. And sometimes it's, you know, quite harmless. Sometimes it is about anti-vaxxing and not vaccinating your children, which can be dangerous, essentially. So I think, I think it's great that you're able to access documentaries like that in that it means people can learn a lot easier. But I think it also, there needs to be a way in which you qualify it properly. And whether that's done by, you know, YouTube or the distributor or what it is, I don't know. But I definitely think it's it's important to get the balance right, and that's something that definitely needs to be looked at. Hattie, what do you think about this? I think you smiled when I mentioned the um, Shane Dawson stuff. Like, what's your kind of? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's really odd because I I literally just remembered that I used to listen to when I had like ages to travel to college because I was stupid and went very far away um <laughs> I used to listen to a lot of true crime podcasts yeah um in themselves like mini audio documentaries um like S-Town and things like that um my favorite murder and loads of weird ones like that but the thing is I would trust them and then I would watch like a YouTube video and I would watch like a Shane Dawson documentary not even the ones that he would do on like Jeffree Star but the mini series he used to do on like conspiracy and I would kind of like laugh along with it but I wouldn't really believe any of it so I don't know what the difference is between like having a voice in my ear like telling me this whole story for like 30 hours or having a 10 minute video that I just write off and don't really believe but I watch because it's more entertainment value I think the thing with the Jeffree Star documentary, which me and my friends actually watched quite a lot, and every night we'd be like texting each other on the group chat, being like, oh my gosh, can you believe this is happening? Um, I, that was just purely for entertainment value. I never like had any interest in Jeffree Star until I watched it. Yeah. And then I think by the final episode when it was like, oh, Shane Dawson is now coming up with a makeup line, it was sort of 
a little it was even more disheartening and being like well actually i don't think i believe the rest of this now because it all feels a bit like a marketing ploy um like i thought something some revelation in terms of morality was going to happen and then it was like no here's an eyeshadow palette that's 70 dollars <laughs> and uh you know take it or leave it and i left it but it, i do i do like shane dawson for the pure like just to watch but then for some reason podcasts and things like that in documentary form i believe maybe it's just me <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Carl? Um, yeah, I definitely think social media and documentaries, they work to some extent quite well because, you know, there's the power of citizen journalism and like us being able to tell stories that we haven't been able to tell before. Um, especially in like these times of Corona, like we can't make documentaries outside and it's quite good to sort of play around with social media to sort of have documentaries in that way. But I do get the risk because like there's the entertainment slash propaganda value like I definitely get that with Sean Dawson like um he does it really subtly but also it's entertainment point like yeah <laughs> like this is not um it's not a documentary in my opinion but I guess I guess it sort of is he's he's performing for us in, in that sense um but yeah, it's, it's not it's like, it's kind of like if you were going to put like a very, very biased or very, very prone to reacting to any situation that he's mm. given Louis Theroux into it. Like it's the same mm. formula. It's like a person, you follow that personality and you enjoy the personality's interaction with it. And that's kind of what drives you to do it. If it was some unknown person talking about Jeffree Star, we possibly wouldn't, it possibly wouldn't get anywhere near as many views as it does. Because who cares what this random person thinks? But Shane Dawson has got this sort of audience of people that are really interested in it so I think my attitude to it is as well that like I sort of think the Shane stuff is taken with a pinch of sort of this is his perspective on it it's not him trying to like say this is ex he does try and say exactly what happened though but whereas other things that I've heard of that are kind of like mini movies like um I want to give like a really quick shout out to a show that I really love called Defunct Land have you guys ever seen Defunct Land? It talks about like kind of how um, theme park rides or like stuff generally to do with kind of like theme parks, whether that's like movie studios and things like that, how they kind of like decline or like how something goes wrong. It's really okay. cool. But that anyway, good. it's really good. And the point, the thing that's so fantastic about it is the guy just tells you every fact about this thing and tells it in this really condensed, really well-made way that uses archive, uses sort of like article screenshots as evidence, everything. He's not even really a personality on it. He just kind of is expository telling you everything rather than sort of engaging with people that, because he can't just go out and talk to CEOs of Disney and people who run like theme parks and stuff. He can't just do that. He's just a regular person like you and I. So he does it and stuff like that. I quite like because it sort of has that element of like less personal element but I suppose it's kind of your attitude to it isn't it it's like what you Patrick was saying that like people go into something if you go into it thinking I'm gonna believe everything this person says or like I'm just gonna implicitly trust this person that's where kind of the problem lies and I suppose you could argue isn't that the same with everything but you would implicitly trust someone like the BBC if you were watching a documentary by I the think even with stuff like that, it's that you know if it's wrong, something's gonna call them out yeah. essentially. Yeah. You know, there's and that you know that there's definitely been a fact checking and like all sorts of like, you know, they have researchers behind it. Whereas for YouTube and and not just YouTube, other stuff as well, you don't know for certain but that's the case. Yeah. I mean it's, you could you could probably say that about a fair few um, Netflix documentaries as well and I know there's been a few on Channel 4 and I can't remember the names that have had controversy around them because people have come out and said well well, actually I'm not sure that is the case yeah. and then they've gotten into a bit of hot water over whether it's trustworthy or not Yeah, an immediate one that jumps to mind that I remember seeing a lot around, do you remember, does anyone remember when Making a Murderer was like the biggest thing at one mm. time? I remember the news came out that like they'd omitted certain kind of information from the series one that I think they kind of addressed a bit more in season two, but that was like a whole year after, 
you know, yeah. like by that point, it's kind of, and it's still up there. It's still, so you're right. There's an element to which there is a certain level of trust and a certain level of you are going to be punished if something isn't really spoken correctly or isn't really yeah. right if you do it this way. Whereas people online, any of us could make a film about whatever we want and say whatever we want, but we're not really going to get in trouble for it unless our close friend kind of like says to us, hey, I think that wasn't really right what you said there, but you could say, well, it's my opinion if you wanted, or it's very slippery slope. I personally like it and think it's a good idea, but I don't, and I have no idea how to police it. Like I'd have no, there isn't a way of doing it, really. I, th I, think, I think that's the problem is that it's so, the benefits do outweigh the costs in that it's so accessible for people to learn yeah. stuff like that and to see these documentaries and for people to, to make them. Yeah. It's such a good thing that it definitely outweighs the kind of the danger of it. But again, yeah, with policing, I don't really know how you do it, no. especially with then you get into questions as to why people would be using, say, YouTube rather than going and finding a different site to put videos up. Because, I mean, I know there's already issues with the way YouTube's policing content that a lot of people have gotten a bit antsy with recently. So if they were to do that, it gets even more so. So, I mean, yeah. the sort of Twitter, like I did a journalism module this year and a sort of thing we studied was like verification and stuff, things like that. And I think Twitter more and more is becoming like a call out tool. Like if you do something wrong, someone will find it and pull it on Twitter because I think I think it was early this year or last year, I can't remember, but um, there was a Prime Minister's Question Times uh, with Boris Johnson and uh, they'd doctored the footage um, in one of the adverts and they'd taken out the laughter um, from one of his response to an audience question. Uh, so it was something about like uh, trust or it was some question like that and uh, He'd replied and the audience had laughed and then in a clip that the BBC had put out as like just a, here's what they asked and here's was the response uh, there was no laughter <laughs> and everyone went off and was like that's not what happened that's not how they replied to it yeah um, but I think with the Shane Dawson thing as well it's difficult because I think he really became friends with like Jake Paul and then he really became friends with Jeffree Star I think if you're friends with someone, you don't have as much of a critical view on them. So yeah, you, you're more inclined to say positive things about them than you are to say negative. And yeah. he did like push Jake Paul to be like, well, what's the truth and things like that. But not as hard as someone like coming in as a stranger and objectively going, well, you've messed up a bit, mate. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> would do. It's, yeah. it's difficult. Uh, I suppose that brings us back to the sort of objectivity part we were talking about before is that you can't along with you know you can't trust whether they'll be caught out and stuff you can't trust whether they're going to be objective about something as well because yeah. you'll find a lot of people who will make a documentary about something that they've got you know they've got skin in the game like mm -hmm. so it's it's a really interesting one I think um, it's not one of those questions that I like, expected everybody to agree on either. Like, I think kind of some people will probably think there shouldn't really be as much freedom, whereas some people will think it's more up to the viewer to be informed and the viewer to make fact check and you so know make sure. So there's kind of two. There's always going to be ends of the spectrum to that. Like, if you yeah. want to just watch something not like mindlessly, but like you, you just implicitly trust it. That's not really a way to be about any kind of piece of information really, I suppose. But like, you can't, I don't, it's like, it's a, you, a, you can't, you can't trust everything, but you can't distrust everything. Either. Exactly. Like that's, exactly. That's sort of the way you've got to strike a balance and everyone's yeah. balance is different. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The kind of next discussion question that I kind of had that I wanted to talk about was kind of like effectiveness which kind of like goes into this kind of uh, territory of trustworthiness and kind of what you would consider to be something that presents the facts and everything. But like my sort of thinking was that like documentaries come in many forms and there are kind of more mainstream things that kind of like are clearly more successful for things like that make it onto Netflix or the sort of stuff we see much more commonly or things that we might see that NBC or a BBC and stuff like that makes. 
Um, but, and there are obviously like the ones that I kind of like noticed are successful. And as everybody does is stuff like the performative stuff, the Michael Moore stuff, the Louis Theroux stuff, the stuff where you follow a person, the Shane Dawson stuff where you're following a person, you're experiencing it and encountering it with this person and everything. And participatory is kind of part of that too, where they're engaging with their subject matter rather than speaking about it from a purely kind of, not outside perspective, but perhaps an expert perspective or somebody that's just kind of like seen this footage and gone, oh, this is what this looks like it's saying. Or a historian maybe that's talking about something old that happened or a scientist that's talking about some theory. It's like they're not engaging with the people they're engaging with a subject matter and of course like interview based is really effective too and it, we see it in virtually every piece of like very especially netflix stuff i can't think of a single netflix movie that was like netflix made where they don't sit down and talk to lots of different people and they intercut it lots of different the same interview t space over like four six episodes along those kinds of lines and those are very different to things like, you know, your animated documentaries, your observational stuff that Carl and I have been studying and things like that. Um, my kind of question is, I don't think anybody denies that there's a place for more avant-garde documentary or stuff that doesn't kind of fall into the mainstream way of constructing a documentary. I don't think anybody's arguing those films shouldn't be made or are pointless. But I do sort of think like, what do you guys think is sort of is it is it worth making something if not many people are going to be able to engage with it you know what i mean like is if people aren't going to engage with the subject matter because of the way the subject matter is presented to you for example like the vax documentary is being told to you expository as if it's a fact or you know sans soleil where it's like sort of done in this unusual essayistic kind of avant-garde way what's you guys' attitude to that anyway sorry that's a lot of information <laughs> you hold, but i'm just um, interested to see what you think really can i just jump in quick because i'm gonna have to go but i'll give a quick answer of course um i think it's very much dependent on your subject matter at that point i think you've got to have something that a lot more people are going to be interested in if you're going to try something like that um because the way in which you deal with a, a less interesting topic would be to have someone that kind of brings you into the situation like Thoreau, you know, you, you, so you feel part of it, then you get interested. Whereas if you're going to do something a bit, I suppose, more risky, you kind of need topics that people are at least somewhat interested in to start with, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. I'm sorry that you have to go by the way. I know, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, I've, I've got to run. Um, <laughs> but sorry. it's been loads of fun. Oh, thank uh, you. Thanks for coming up. <laughs> I hope all the rest goes really well. I will, uh, it will. Catch you and we're not going to be long. Yeah, see you in a bit. <laughs> see you in a bit. Bye. 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 Um, so, yeah, no, what do you guys think? Kind of, do you, Patty, Carl, do you want to go? In fact, Carl, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, um, about effectiveness, right? Okay. Um, yeah, effectiveness, I, I think that's going to be a, a, um, a slight blurring of um, fact and fiction due to like using social media. Um, it's quite difficult, like it's becoming more difficult to now tell which one is fact and which one is fiction, especially if we just use social media a lot for um, documentary filmmaking. Because um, like, of course, there's always performativity, but like, what facts did this tell us um, about, like, truthful as in like, um, uh, yeah, because there's, there's always going to be a deeper truth. I get that, but like, we're not going philosophical. There's always a side of documentary where you go, oh yeah, that's deep. That, that's like, oh, that's, that's what I get from that. But there's also the straightforward facts that people always sort of want in documentaries. And that's, um, I think that's what people get a lot, um, want to get a lot, I mean, in documentaries. Um, yeah, there's also competition as well um, with social media because there's always going to be people who's going to make the same documentaries about the same topics and like people have to sort of think of like, oh, what's going to be new and what's quite controversial in that sense. So I think the anti-vaxxing stuff and all that stuff comes with that um, reason. Yeah, I think like 
there's it seems like there's a special formula from what I've kind of gathered unless you're poetic but that's an expression but the thing I was going to say is that like it seems like there's this special formula of like there has to be facts and statements that are told without a bias mm -hmm. and an emotional experiential element to them in the most kind of poignant ones I've ever watched there's certainly been an element to which like here are facts about this thing here is how these facts affected me or here is how mm -hmm. this event affected me or this other person and stuff like that which is obviously different in things like poetic stuff but poetic stuff is kind of being told through the this is how this affected me and so it's mm -hmm. harder to kind of that's why those avant-garde sort of slightly out of the mainstream documentaries often don't get kind of as known about and as kind of spread about because why would they when it's it relies so much on your interpretation rather than just the digestion of facts and the digestion of information you have to interpret it all yourself and I think that's what mainstream audiences not not that they're dumb it's just that you expect a certain level of like I'm gonna trust what this says and I'm gonna just take it in and I'm not gonna, you know, this is just, I'm gonna reflect on it rather than like decide I disagree or agree or yeah. how does this affect me kind of thing. But yeah. Patty, what do you think? I mean, it's just a level flashbacks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We, we did um, a documentary on Nick uh, Cave, not Cage. I always wanna call him Nick Cage and I'm like, no, it's the wrong one. It's Nick Cage. <laughs> The singer um, mm. called Twenty Thousand Days on Earth, um, and that's like a day in the life, but it's obviously not a day in the life because it's all filmed like over a number of weeks, um, and we pulled apart like pieces of the script. And there's mm. a bit where he says like, "Oh, um, my hometown of Brighton or something like that," and well, actually, he doesn't. Like he lives in Brighton, but it's not his hometown. His hometown is Australia. And then there's another bit where he goes to look at some like archive footage, and it's all like factual. It's all photos of him uh, living in this dorm room and like the things he used to collect. It's so random, um, but the the film implies that that exists in Brighton. Well, actually, exists, but it's in Australia. Um, and there's loads of like little connections that actually aren't true. Like the end is a gig. I think in the like posh symphony hall or whatever it is and um but it's never like showing him or how he gets there because then the end shot is him in Brighton so it's all very like not day in the life at <laughs> all but that's how the film advertises itself to be and there's even like right in the opening he sort of wakes up but then there's a body next to him and you think it's his wife but you don't actually know if it's his wife um and he gets up and he goes into his office, but then his office is so staged because it looks like a scene from Harry Potter and there's books everywhere. <laughs> and you're like, and he's on his typewriter and you're like, Nick, mate, you don't write with a typewriter. I don't believe that. <laughs> it's so, but there's so many, like there's truth in it. And there's also like, you just straight up lying. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really difficult to like know where it stops and then know where it starts, if that makes sense. Cause, no. Uh, yeah. He did like interviews with people that he'd worked with before, like um, Kylie Minogue is in one of the bits because they did a song together. And uh, he's literally just driving and then the camera turns to the road and then it turns back and Kylie Minogue's in the car. <laughs> and <you're> like, <laughs> she must have been running very fast to get in there. <laughs> um, but like it happens with like three other people and it is just, it's such a good film to watch from that perspective but then you compare it to some like really factual documentary like Taxi Tehran like the Iranian yeah. filmmaker Jafar Panahi uh who I always called Jafar Panini in A Level Film Studies <laughs> I did not know how to pronounce his name and um <laughs> and but his is so real and realistic and raw and literally was filmed on like a dash camera that he had on the front of the car and then had like another one behind him and that was it <laughs> um, but even some of that feels staged, like the yeah. discussions are too obvious for what they could yeah. be about. What was the name um, of this movie again? Taxi to Ron. Okay. It's really good. I think it might be somewhere online. I can't remember. Okay. Um, yeah. That's... But yeah, I might even have a DVD that I can throw at someone. Um, 
<laughs> uh, I think I have one for 20,000 days on Earth. I have a mini library now. <laughs> you get but, Yeah, documentary collection is growing. I think my attitude to this kind of like effectiveness and successfulness thing is that like you always want, you're going to always want more people to see your film than others but like ultimately with documentary never really being the true mainstream anyway like it never gets in cinemas and if it does it's only got a really short like running you know like I guess like though now that we're in quarantine it's a particularly interesting environment for like you people are much more accessing their like I've had like, my friend Anna just the other day was like saying I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have run through all of my like Netflix entirely by the end of this quarantine because like oh I, all I do is watch stuff and read stuff when you're not doing uni work obviously like a couple of like month or two ago and like I do think like I see a lot of people post about I mean the infamous it's not really a film but the infamous Tiger King like hour long episodes right like six of them so however long anyway doesn't really matter but like documentaries do have this kind of a law that fiction does not really have in that like it's true stories it's baffling to see these true experiences and they're just they're always going to be around they're always going to be there but the idea of like a mainstream documentary is has got a specific formula has got a specific kind of idea of how it works and everything but at the same time you can make a ton of those and then still not be like seen by loads and loads of people so is kind of like the way it's made and how successful it is really important for how effective it is at conveying its message if ultimately like the definition says that it's like intended to document reality primarily for the purpose of instruction education or maintaining historical record it's doing all of that, no matter how many people see it. It's just for them I to keep like it made. Tiger King was a really weird one, though. Like, it was. It's become some sort of phenomenon. It has. I can't even say that word. Um, but no one quite understands how or all. I think it. I think it is Joe Exotic. I think it's the character and this person over. He's they also made like that built in up. Way. And oh God, yeah. Yeah. Because Louis Theroux did a episode on him, like quite a few years beforehand, and that blew up on Netflix after Tiger oh, King wow. blew up because everyone was like, "Oh my god, this exists!" Oh, cool! Um, and I watched it, and Joe Exotic is a completely different person. He that seems, I maybe it was just like my perception of it, but he yeah. felt a lot more caring, and was there's like one bit where a storm was about to break. And um, whereas if that had happened in the Tiger King episode, which I think it did in one of them, he was like encouraging the cameras to stay and like, no, you've got to film this, you've got to see what I do. But he was saying to the BBC crew, like, this structure is not particularly stable um, where we are right now. He said, do you want to get inside, like, just for your safety and for your equipment? Because we've got to look after the tigers and make sure they're all safe. Yeah. Um, and not, they didn't, they, they stayed and filmed but he had a different personality about him. And it did make me wonder, like, if the crew on Tiger King, because I think it's in the start of the first episode, they do say, like, this is not what we set out to film. We set out to make something quite different. And it, it's become this weird, Joe Exotic, chaotic nightmare. <laughs> um, and like, it does make me wonder whether there was something in them that triggered this celebrity status in him that went crazy I don't know but it as much as I, yeah as much as I say oh it could have been made no matter what in whatever way <laughs> it, it would have still been successful I kind of backtrack that comment actually because so much of documentaries isn't the way that sounds harsh but it's not really how they're made it's the story it's like ultimately if the story is super super interesting it doesn't have to be told in the most exciting or most um avant-garde or most kind of uh, at least engaging way mm -hmm. if the story is interesting like it, it it will transcend but there is elements to which everything about tiger king complements it to be successful like it's very i think the people who engaged with him if if you, what you're saying is like kind of that he possibly does act differently to how he does in other things, that kind of points to they engineered him to look 
a certain way and engineered him to act a certain way. Or if the Tiger King people are more accurate, Louis Theroux is kind of in like sort of uh, in just like I oh, can't think of the word is, but like made him kind of look at yeah. it. So no matter what, that's not it probably isn't him changing. It could be, but it, it's mm-hmm. probably the way they're doing it that's creating that impression. I mean, the good thing about the Tiger King documentary, and I think aside from the fact that Nick Cage is going to play Joe Exotic, which I can't wait for, um, was that I don't think anyone involved with it, like uh, Carol Baskin or anything like that, um, were happy with their representation. And in a weird way, I think that's quite good. Because if no one's like pleased with how you've represented them, I think you've sort of done your job of being subjective and that's not good taking point. a side with anyone, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, yeah. But I know Joe Exotic is now like quite famous and getting a lot of letters and things like that. And I, I can't remember what he said about it, but for the most part, a lot of people have just straight up denied it and taken it out and said they're not associated with it anymore because they just don't like it. But it's just this power of like how they can change what you like. Considering, I mean, Carl and I will have had this similar experience of like when we make documentaries of our own, whether they're like of family members or friends or somebody like uh, someone we're following, it is incredibly easy to make somebody look whatever type of way you want. Like, Mm -hmm. even if, and we obviously try and be like respectful and everything because we can't pay these subjects. We can't like give them any kind of incentive other than that we want to make a film that is about you and is hopefully something you're going to like and something you're going to maybe want to work with us again for or something along those lines because we're students like we can't but if you're going to pay somebody there's an element and you've signed it there's an element to which like I have creative control now and I ultimately Mm. I decide how you are portrayed not you you know Carl it's like you're you're kind of like you do you agree on that it's a bit iffy to sort of pay subjects and I definitely think that um, not paying them just puts them more like they're showing who they really are and that they're not sort of acting. Because like, if you sort of pay, it's like, it comes into this sort of fictional um, bit yeah. now when you pay actors and now they're actors in your in their eyes, basically. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure there must be some documentaries there that must have paid like people, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't have any on yeah. my head. Um, have either of you heard of the Amazing Jonathan documentary? No. Oh no. Because I haven't I haven't seen it, but I know it's on like BFI player or something like that, and I need to find it because I'm obsessed with it. Um but it's about this magician called The Amazing Jonathan, um, who worked in Las Vegas and he was really popular, doing really well, and then he suddenly got like terminal cancer. He wasn't gonna survive this was it he did a whole farewell tour this documentary queue followed him on it I think and then he made this miraculous recovery and he suddenly pulls through on it and is alive again and everyone's like okay great like glad you're not dead but um is that real or is that part of like your magic act and your marketing um and it apparently it just is an absolute chaos and um some other like crew turns up yeah and it turns out there's like two people filming him and no one quite knows how it's happened or why it's happened That's except so for him interesting. and it is like absolutely bonkers everything i've heard about it um that sounds incredible but it is sort of one of those like on the on the trot sort of films where you don't quite know where it's going to go but I need to watch <laughs> <laughs> well um, do you guys have anything to say before I kind of close out and say goodbye and everything anything at all no cool. <laughs> I'm just going to plug our events and everything um, so 
on Monday, we're Netflix partying when Harry met Sally uh, at 7 p.m. So check it. Hey, check it out. It's such a good film. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was actually, when I started watching it, like on Netflix party, Hattie straight away was like, oh my God. <laughs> it's so good. I was like, yes. And it is very fantastic. It's very great. But it's in honor of Na UK National Kissing Day because we sort of thought, do we want to like be memey about this? Or so we're like, yeah, let's watch a romance movie. Why not? <laughs> Um, then on Tuesday, we're going to have a poll up at 12 noon for what animated film we're going to watch the next Monday after this one. Minions. Coming, which is, <laughs> shut up. It's just the 29th. <laughs> you, George speaks, I think, enough for you in our committee. Like, I feel like Why? you're kind of, I feel like both of you echo the same, I don't know, values. Like, you both, if George is, I don't know. I feel like if George suggests something, I feel like you're on board with it somehow. I don't know. I feel like he's got some good suggestions that we've put on the animation one, but yeah. Okay, as long as they're good, then I'll. I'll I think that. they're good. I <laughs> think they're good. They're more. I will admit they're like more. Um, not like adult animation. That sounds weird, but like I'm trying to. I was trying to orient it to like Oscar nominee and Oscar yeah. winning, os like animated movies rather than like kind of kids mainstream stuff because I wasn't sure if people would want to watch that considering like most of our audience is like eighteen over, but. You can't underestimate the power of like being nostalgic over a kids movie and like how many people you know like what? we watched Matilda the other day and we had like twelve people on that screening. So I don't think Hotel Transylvania is a terrible film. I don't. And I ruined my reputation by. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Hotel Transylvania is terrible. No, not at all. I don't think it is. Carl, have you seen Hotel Transylvania? I have not. Oh, you should watch it. Oh no. Um, we'll never explain it. Yet. <laughs> I the I don't. No, sorry, Carl, go on. Is it Netflix? Yeah, I think, yes, it is, because I started watching it. Yes, it is. <laughs> I, I, my feelings are a little bit less. I watched one, two, and three all in one go. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of thought number two is a bit weak. Oh, okay. and, num and number three, <laughs> number three. No, it was not as good as the time I watched all the Chipmunks movies in one go. <laughs> that was it sounds so like chaotic evil energy. It was so good. <laughs> we I could do a whole episode, I think, on the Alvin and the Chipmunks movies. I genuinely think I, I could I, I'm so funny. I'll go with you. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Okay. Anyway, maybe not a two hour one like this one has ended up being somehow. I don't, did not expect no, that. I, I think we go for four hours. I think we just four stretch out the length there. of all the films. Mm. Yeah. And we wouldn't, we'd have to fit movie news somewhere else in a game somewhere no. else. Like the hour is just for. We'll send an email out with it on, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that's going up on Tuesday. The. What Tuesday is it actually? I think it's Tuesday the 23rd. And um peter would tell me to plug the courier you're a courier person hasi you courier read person. the courier oh. read Can my articles especially they're read quite good articles. what did you say carl um yeah the courier is amazing um yeah they're, they're really good articles yeah. um it's quite sad that i'll be leaving soon anyway but hey i'll read still be Carl's here articles. <laughs> <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> I think it's great how they've carried on doing it throughout like all this time I think it's been it's been lovely when I've been on Twitter just seeing like ah oh, my friend's written an article oh it's, it's cool it's really really nice it's literally keeping me stable I'm <laughs> getting me out of bed in the morning oh, <laughs> sometimes yeah. I'm like oh, okay I'll get up and have a shower and do a career article now <laughs> everything else is a bit like oh. lovely um and just for anybody listening or watching if you'd like to check out some of our previous episodes you can find audio versions of them on mixcloud at mixcloud.com slash filmsock slash like forward slash um or one word filmsock and our youtube channel which is ncl filmsock ncl or one word in capital so ncl space film sock or one word because we now have been uploading these live streams on youtube so just in case you don't catch them when they're live you can catch them whenever you want uh, the ghibli ones up blockbusters one is up uh really great um i highly recommend by the way i'm forgetting to mention this i highly recommend the writer's room episode that we did a couple of weeks back that's on our youtube channel that's a table read where we had members of film sock read out parts from members is 
um, screenplays that they wrote, which is really good. It's like listening to mini audiobooks. They're all like <laughs> around like five to sort of 10 minutes long. They're really great. I really enjoy them. So they're all up on the YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of um, fixes us up. I've, we've got a very exciting uh, episode planned for next week, but I don't want to say anything about it just yet. It's really good. It's exciting. Anyway, so thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Patrick, who's not here anymore. But thank you, Carl. Thank you, Hattie. It's been very lovely. And we'll see you all next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Hey. I hate that woman's voice. She's so good. <laughs> She's good, isn't she? She just looks like the recording has stopped. Hi, <laughs> what's next week? I can't tell you. Oh, I mean, I can tell you. We were two hours and three minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh. It's because we started up talking about Transylvania and the Minions. <laughs> you know, that's the first time I've ever hosted an over two hour long show. That's the first I time. The Ghibli one was like two hours. The Ghibli one might have been two hours, actually, now that you say that. It was certainly a long time. Remember. That one was a long one. <laughs> it was good, though. I oh, my God. That. that was so fun. It was so fun. Mm. I feel like I should have sent that to film days when I was like pitching my Ghibli article. I should have been <laughs> like, oh, I love Ghibli. listen to this two hours of talking. I did <laughs> two hour long show where we just talk about ones we like. Oh, it's not it to Grace. Sorry, Sorry, what? No, no, go on. What were you saying? Oh, I sent it to Grace today because I was like, can you read this please? Because you're smart and you're the editor. And <laughs> she was like, yeah, but I've seen like one Ghibli film. So oh. I'll just do like grammar for you. Oh bless! Oh, that's sweet. That's she, fine. She read it and she was like, "I want to watch Ghibli films now." And I was like, "Oh, oh that's bless! That's sweet." That makes me think. Oh, if oh, if like... I'd written something and someone had gone, "I want to watch more now because you've said that," I'd be like, "Oh, <clears throat> yes." So I'm like, "Oh, I used to send that next week." Actually, I haven't done it yet. Oh yeah, when's that due in? So lazy. I think it's the twenty fourth or the twenty third. It's the word count's done now. It's down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wrote, Carl, I wrote 1,500 words uh, and my limit was 1,000, uh, so I had to get rid of a lot. <laughs> oh my god. Um, it's still, it, did it, have you managed to cut any of it yet? Yeah, it's, I think it's bang on 1,000 words now, or just under because of the title. Um, but I had to email them today and I was like, do you want me to put a picture on because you didn't really say so. Yeah. But I'll have to order the magazine when it gets published. Yeah. No. Should be fun. That'll be cool. I hope you like get it and get it in time and everything. Oh yeah, I hope they actually publish it and pay me. <laughs> that would be really great. I hope they do. That'd be awesome. It, it would be really annoying if they just write it and we're like, no, this is shit. No, <laughs> we're okay. No, no, we just don't want it. <laughs> I'm sure they won't. I'm sure they won't. But I hope so. I'm so excited to watch When Harry Met Sally again. I know, I only watched it really recently. I'm a bit bummed that I watched it so recently. Otherwise, I should have watched it with all you guys. But Have you seen You've Got Mail? Have you watched that? No, yet? I will watch that. I might watch that I, tomorrow, I, actually. If you need someone to watch it with, <laughs> I, I will always watch that film. Oh, thank you. Awesome. I might hit you up, actually. I might save it and watch it with you. So then. It's so good. I will, like bash the keyboard out with words that I know. <laughs> I've seen <laughs> I was it that much. I didn't answer your message because I ended up rushing a little bit my tea and then like getting all this set up but I like just smashing the keyboard. It's, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll Amazing. turn this off because I'm sure you all want to go and chill now. So <laughs> I'll um, see you all. I don't know when I'll actually see you guys next but I'll certainly Monday. talk to you, Patty, soon, and I hope you're all right, Carl, and I'll probably speak to you soon as mm. well. Thank you very much for coming on. It was nice to see you, because we haven't seen you in quite a, a, a while, so it's nice. But yeah, anyways, I will see you guys at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.